Well, do I have anybody here that ain't no grave? They're going to hold your body down. Do I have anybody here because of Jesus? You're going to rise again. Let me hear a big hand clap of praise to you guys. Thank you, those of you that are watching us online as well. I missed y'all last week, but man, I'm just telling you right now, you didn't need to feel sorry for me because my family went all, all out on my birthday, buddy. I ain't kidding. They took me down to the beach. We got a beachfront, you know, condo. And, uh, man, uh, we went out to eat. They fed me. We went to uh, the uh, gospel brunch at the House of Blues and sang gospel and just worshiped Jesus and then went back and had cake. And not only birthday cake, but my precious daughter brought, brought me two big dozen hot and now Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> Is that not love or what? And she said, Daddy... You don't have to share these with anybody, and I didn't. And uh, so anyway, well, it's good to be back. Love you guys. Always miss you guys when we're not, we're not around. How many of you know it's good to be at Ann Lake Baptist Church? Say a big amen. Amen. And it is. It is. Uh, last week, uh, Pastor Andrew introduced us to the breaking of these uh, six seals. Actually, he said popping. That's the difference between a 30-year-old. But anyway, and so uh, we, we, we talk about Jesus breaking these seals, and the, the breaking of these seals begins this, this great tribulation that's going to fall upon the earth. Now, here's my question is, why does God do this tribulation on earth in the first place? And that's, that's a good question. God's got a love. He's got a mercy. He's not a grace. But why do we have this great tribulation that's going to fall on the earth? And it is a great tribulation with a capital T, uh, not, a, not a small T. Well, I agree with those that believe that, you know, basically three reasons. Number one, to wake up unbelievers. God always wants to see people saved. Uh, but, but, but let me remind you, you know, and I, I personally believe in the rapture. I believe the church is going to be taken out. There will be millions left behind. And in case you're saying, well, I'll just let the rapture happen, then I'll get saved because I don't know what's going on. Let me remind you, 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 you can get saved, but I'm telling you, it's going to be through tremendous tribulation, and I personally believe more than likely it's going to be through martyrdom. You're going to have to die for your faith in order to do that. But the bottom line is God wants people to be saved. He doesn't give up. He's, he's, going, to, he's going to just be offering salvation to the very end before it's eternally too late. So not only to wake up unbelievers, but number two, to shake up the nation of Israel. Now, God has always had a special place in his heart for the nation of of Israel. They are God's chosen people, and, uh, and yet Israel still rejects the Messiah uh, or rejects Jesus as being Messiah. So the, the great tribulation uh, is God's message of salvation, especially to the Jews, uh, that, uh, that, that, that he's trying to get them come to Jesus before it's eternally too late as well. Now, don't make the mistake that a lot of people do. Don't equate Israel with the church. A lot of people try to spiritualize Israel uh, with the church. Now, the church has its place. Church is special to God. Uh, we are in that church age right now. We're in that day of grace right now. Uh, but never confuse how God loves the Jews, but you can't spiritualize. Israel's Israel. The Jews are Jews, and the church uh, is the church. Uh, so Israel still has a special place in God's heart, and God is using that great tribulation uh, to bring many, many of them back before it is finally too late. And then so not only uh, do we have the make up or, or to wake up believers and shake up the, the Jewish nation, but also to make up uh, the final kingdom of God. Those uh, that will be saved uh, at the end of the tribulation, those that have been saved for all the millennials before then, those of us, whatever, will, will finally make up the whole kingdom of God uh, at the end of the tribulation period. Then it'll be, the doors will be shut, and nobody else will ever get saved. And so uh, God wants to make up his final kingdom of God. Now, there are three events uh, that reveal God's wrath uh, on the earth uh, that, we, that we're going to talk about uh, as we study and continue our study in the book of Revelation. First of all, there's seven seals that are broken. Uh, we talked about this, and, the, and these, are, these are all worse before the other ones. They build on each other. Uh, You have the sixth seal. The seventh seal introduces uh, the seven trumpets. So you have six seals that are broken, seven trumpets that are blown, and then you're going to have seven bowls uh, that are poured out. And and Andrew did a wonderful job of letting us know this scene up in heaven when this seal, uh, this this seven-sealed scroll 
uh, that is being held up at the throne of God, knowing that judgment is getting ready to be pronounced on earth, and they're crying out, who's worthy? Who can open? Who, who in the world can be that control of the events in the earth that's, that's worthy to open the seal? We find out that Jesus is worthy. Do I have anybody here today that still believes Jesus always has been and Jesus always will be the answer and all God's people have? Amen. Jesus is worthy to open. Now, last week we looked at the six seals of judgment on the earth that are broken. Uh, the first seal is the white horse, uh, which is the conquest of the Antichrist. The second seal is the red horse, uh, which introduces war and conflict on the earth like the earth has never seen before. We've always had war. We've always had conflict. But keep in mind, this is the great. Everybody say great. great. This is the great tribulation. Uh, so uh, we're going to have war and conflict like the earth has never seen before. The third seal is the black horse, uh, which is famine and economic instability uh, that the earth has never experienced before. The fourth seal is the pale horse, which is the death of billions with a B. Uh, that the earth has never seen before at one time. Then the fifth seal is kind of strange, but it's the prayer and the cry of the martyrs that are crying out through the centuries and crying out in heaven, how long, Lord? How long are you going to let this go on? How long before you avenge us? And, and God is revealing to them, uh, you just hang in there. I'm in control. I keep score. But understand this, there are going to be many, many more martyrs. There are going to be many more people die before for the cause of Christ before all of this is open uh, or over. And then the sixth seal is universal natural catastrophes like the world has never seen before. Now, at the end of chapter 6, beginning at verse 17, we find out this warning. Uh, listen to how we finished out chapter 6. Because the great day of their wrath, and some translations say his wrath, but because of the great day of wrath has come, who is able to stand? It's a great question. Uh, this is not going to be a sun. This, this is going to make Noah's flood look like a Sunday afternoon picnic. Who in the world is able to stand with all of this judgment, the wars, the famine, the economic instability, the deception of government, the deception of the Antichrist, and all of that? Who is going to be able to stand? And is, this is just the beginning. We haven't gotten to the trumpet judgments yet. We haven't gotten to the bowl judgments yet that each build on the other and each gets worse than the other. And so in God's dear name, we need a break. Yes. We, need a, we need a little breather. And that's why we have chapter 7. And I think it's wonderful how the Bible does this, that chapter 7 follows chapter 6. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> in chapter 7, is, it's kind of like an interlude. And it's a behind-the-scenes look at what's going on in heaven as all these catastrophes are going on on the earth. It's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a reminder that even in wrath, don't forget, yes, God is a God of love and, and God's a God of grace and God's a God of mercy, but he's also a God of wrath. But even in his wrath, in the middle of his wrath, he is still our Heavenly Father. Yeah. He is still our shepherd. Matter of fact, Habakkuk 3.2, Habakkuk cried out one day. He said, God, in your wrath, remember mercy. And uh, actually, chapter 7 might be an answer to Habakkuk's prayer years and years ago. God, in your wrath, remember mercy. And so as we get into chapter 7, we get a little breather here. And uh, before we get into all the other destruction and all the weird stuff that's going to go on, we get a little breather here and we get a glimpse of what goes on in heaven. So everybody take your Bible. I uh, ho hope you have your Bible with you. Take your Bible, turn your Bible on, get to the Word of God, however you get to the Word of God in Revelation chapter 7. And we're going to be beginning at verse 1. And so let's all stand. I like to do that. I like to stand for the reading of God's Word for many reasons. It just makes you understand this ain't me talking, it's God talking. Plus, you need a little break uh, because once you sit down, you're going to be sitting down for a long, long time. <laughs> I already got y'all nervous, okay? Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. After this, after what, the, the breaking of the six, six seals, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth restraining the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel rising up from the east who had the seal of the living God. 
And he cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were allowed to harm, who were allowed to harm the earth and the sea, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the Israelites. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the great time of worship today, for the, all the Bible studies that have gone on today. Thank you, Father, for uh, all that you do among us. We just we're so careful to praise you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You, uh, you may be seated. I'm going to try my best to kind of unpack a little bit of this of what we're seeing today. Let's go back to verse 1. Uh, in verse 1, he says, after this, after the breaking of the seals, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds of the earth. Now, this is not an indictment that the earth is not round. Uh, this, abs- this has to do with the four uh, points of the compass of the earth, north, south, east, and west. And, uh, and so basically, these four angels are ready to let loose all the judgment on the whole earth. Uh, but right now, they're restraining the winds of judgment. But then another angel rises up, another angel, unnamed angel, who uh, seems to be more powerful than these other four angels. And look what uh, he says in verse 3. In verse 3, he said, Don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until uh, we seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, a lot of people try to think that this angel is Jesus himself. I don't believe this angel is Jesus. Let me tell you why. Does anybody realize Jesus is far above the angels? All right. Uh, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is above the angels. So this is, a, uh, this is another angel. This is a powerful angel. Next week, we'll kind of look at, uh, you know, kind of the, the way angels kind of operate in heaven. But this is another angel. And this angel says, look, before we release this judgment on the earth, There's a group of people that God wants to seal with a seal of protection, all right? Uh, So so God has a special group of people during the Great Tribulation that he wants to seal with a protection for a purpose. The number of this group of people is 144,000. This is a literal number. Now, here's the question. Who are the 144,000 people? that are sealed. And I know you've been waiting to get here. Uh, somebody said, I, I can't wait till we get to that part because I want to find out what the pastor says, who the 144,000 are. Well, first of all, it all depends on who you ask. If, if you ask a Jehovah Witness, a Jehovah Witness will tell you that the 144,000 are Jehovah Witnesses. And they're not just any Jehovah Witness. They are the special uh, Jehovah Witnesses that have... Uh, really given their life to the cause. They have earned and worked their way up to, they've earned the right to be 144,000. Now, let me just say a word about that. I want you to listen to me. Listen to me say amen. Amen. If a Jehovah Witness comes to your door, and they will, uh, when a Jehovah Witness comes to your door and they start talking about, don't you want to be part of the 144,000? Don't you want to be part of the chosen uh, that's going to be when the earth is going through tribulation? You might want to remind them of this fact. You might want to look at them and say, well, listen, your, uh, your religion, Jehovah Witnesses, was founded in 1870. And during that time, from 1870 to now, there have been over 21 million Jehovah Witnesses enlisted in your religion. And I kind of suspect that through the centuries, that out of 21 million Jehovah Witnesses, probably already by now, 144,000 of them have already made it. So you're wasting my time, and let me remind you, you are wasting your time too, because they've already been made it. You're not going to make it, so you're wasting our time. So what you really need to do, Jehovah Witness, you need to come to Air Lake Baptist Church to hear some sound doctrine. That all God's people say. That's what you really need to do, because you ain't going to make it. It's already been made, if you believe that. Of course, we don't believe that. So who are the 144,000 that are sealed. Well, this is, you remember Andrew had been saying for the last several weeks 
He said, when you read the book of Revelation, you study the book of Revelation, you need to remember that the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. And here's a great example of exactly what Andrew's talking about, uh, because this is not hard at all. As a matter of fact, it is so simple to decipher and discern who the 144,000 is, Mr. Rogers could do it to a bunch of kindergartners. Boys and girls, can you say 144,000? That's a lot of people. Boys and girls, do you know who the 144,000? I'll forget that. But anyway, so uh, it's plain, it's simple. The main thing are the plain things. The plain things are the main things. So God tells us who the 144,000 are. You don't have to spiritualize it. Uh, you don't have to make more of it than what it is. Uh, so listen to what he said. He said, these are 144,000 that out of the tribe of where? Or out of, out of the nation of where? Israel. Everybody say Israel. Israel. They're out of the tribes, all 12 tribes of Israel. By the way, Israel's not the church. Don't confuse Israel with the church. Don't try to spiritualize this. This is Israel. The Jews are the Jews. The church is the church. And this is Israel. And these 144,000 Jews are protected by God during the tribulation. Why? So that they can be evangelists. So that they can tell the world, and especially the Jewish world, that Jesus really is Lord. That Jesus really is the Messiah. And God will use them to make converts all over the world and join other believers in heaven before it's eternally too late. Now, let's skip ahead. Look at Revelation 14 very quickly. Look at Re Revelation 14. Look at verse 3 uh, so you can see this. Revelation 14, 3. Listen to what it said. It says, they, now the they is 144,000. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Now, why does this 144,000 have a song that nobody else can sing? Well, that's not nothing unusual. You do understand that at one time the angels had a song that we couldn't sing. You remember when they came to the birth of Jesus, when they came to the shepherds, they and they, they, the Bible says they said it. I prefer to think maybe they sung it, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, that kind of thing, uh, because Jesus had, Jesus had just been born. Uh, so, But now, how many of you know we, if you're a believer in Jesus, how many of you praise the Lord, we have a song that the angels cannot sing. If there's any envy in heaven, which I don't think there is, but if there was, the angels are envious to us. They look at us and say, my soul, how much God loves those people. How much God loves them to send his son Jesus to die for them and to redeem them and to sing at Aaron Lake Baptist Church, ain't no grave going to hold me down. I wish I could sing that, but angels can't sing that. But you and I can sing that. And Stephanie's not the only one that can sing it. We can all sing it. And all God's people say can't sing it as good as her, but you can sing it. Right? We have it. Listen, listen, come on, come on. Listen to me. When you die, if you're a child of God, when you die, you ain't going to be no angel. That's right. You're better than the angels. You're not going to be no angel. You are a saint, a blood bought child of the living God. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Yes. So, these 144,000 have a song that you and I can't sing because they're Jews. They've been protected by God, and they've been mightily used by God during the Great Tribulation time. Uh, let's, uh, let, let, let's go back. Now, in chapter 7, uh, what we have is we have this hope of thousands of people being able to get saved during the Tribulation time. Now, now they're going to have to suffer for it, uh, they're going to have to suffer tremendous persecution, more than likely even martyrdom in order to do it, but they can end up in heaven. Now, go to chapter 7, look at verse 9, and look at what John says. Chapter 7, verse 9, after this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, 
people and language which no one could number. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne. Look at verse 12, saying, Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. That's why I try to get you to say that all the time. I'm just trying to get you to practice. Saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and forever. Amen. Glory to God. Now, the question is, were they very effective? Well, look at verse 13. Then one of the elders asked me, Who are those people in white robes, and where did they come from? I love this answer. John says, uh, you know. I mean, you know, right? And, you know, the elder looks at him and says, you don't know, do you, John? You know, he says, no, I really don't. He said, well, I'll tell you. The plain things are the main things. The main things are the plain things. He's not going to leave us in the dark. He said, you don't know who they are? I'll tell you who they are. Listen to what he said. Then he told me, verse 14, these are the ones coming out of great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I want to give you very, very quickly, I'm going to get you out of here, but I want want you to look at three wonderful things God shows us about heaven. There's a lot of things we don't know about heaven, but heaven is not near the mystery that we think it is. And there are three wonderful things that God shows us about heaven in this verse as we just read. Here they are. First of all, I want you to look at the great unity in heaven. The great unity in heaven. In verse 9, he talks about every tribe from every nation, from every people, from every language. Listen to me and listen well. You know what you don't see in heaven? You don't see prejudice. You know what you see in heaven? You don't see black. You don't see white. You don't see Chinese. You don't see African American. You, 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 you don't see Spanish. You don't see German. Uh, you don't see politics. You don't see Democrats. You don't see Republican. Glory to God. You don't see any of that. What you see in heaven is all people, all nations, all languages, worship together. We are unified in God's dear name in heaven. There is not going to be any division. There's going to be no more crying, no more dying, and that's what heaven's like. And all God's people said, amen and amen. You're not going to have any of that in heaven anymore. The unity that's in heaven. And in God's dear name, listen to me, church. Listen to your pastor. Why in God's dear name can we not practice some of that right here on earth? Why does church have to be the most segregated place on the face of the planet? Everybody that Jesus loves, Jesus loves them all, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. And in God's dear name, the church of the living God ought to rise up and say, listen, if you're a brother in Christ, you're my brother, you're my sister. I don't care if you like this music, you don't like this music. I don't care if you want to be here, you want to be there, you want to be a big church, you want to be in a little church, you want to be a formal church, you want to be an influence. I could care less. You're my brother and sister in Christ. And one day, we're going to worship before the throne of grace. All God's people say that. I'm preaching now. The great unity. The unity in heaven. No division. Not only that, I want you to look at the great family in heaven. Look at the great family in heaven. After all these years of Pastoring, I I still get people saying, Pastor, what what do you think heaven's going to be like? Uh, Here's one of the great questions people ask me. Will we know each other in heaven? Will we be recognizable? Well, look at the great family in heaven. If you read verses 15 through 17, those two verses, and we won't have time to do it right now, but if you read those two verses, 15 through 17, you will find that John, or that God, uses the word they and them nine times. In two verses, they and them. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. When you die and go to heaven, you're not going to be sitting on a cloud somewhere. You're not going to be by yourself with a harp sitting on a cloud and, and, and wearing a baby's diaper. Can I get an amen? Amen? You're going to be in heaven with loved ones. You're, you're going to be in heaven with people that have gone on before. You're going to see your mama. If she was saved, and you're saved, 
you go see your wife who she went on before you or your husband tonight. We're going to seek to honor our widows and widowers in this room with a banquet. And we're going to love on them for a little while. Because I can't imagine being without my wife on this earth. You're going to see your daddy, they're saved, you're saved. Ladies, you're going to see your little babies that were taken from you and they're in baby land in heaven. You're going to see them and they're going to know you and you're going to know them. You're going to see your kids that left you before their time. It's a family in heaven. We're going to know each other. And we're not going to know each other like we do down here. We're going to know each other better up there. We're going to love each other better up there. But there is family in heaven. All God's people say. I've had people ask me, will my dog be in heaven? Well, if they're a golden retriever, they will be. I'd, listen, folks. There are horses in heaven. There are sheep in heaven. There's lions in heaven. There's lambs in heaven. I don't know. All I know is heaven is a wonderful place of union and unity and family is going to be in heaven. And all God's people said. But here's the last thing, and I'm through. Listen to this. I want you to see the great comfort that's in heaven. The great comfort. I, uh, I'm getting older. I, uh, I've been around a while. And right now I'm just going to speak out of a voice of a little bit of experience. But um, life is hard. Life can be tough. I've been around long enough to see families that could cry a bathtub full of tears. I've seen enough heartache and heartbreak as a pastor for all of these years. And I know life is tough. Life is hard. But hey, folks, hang in there. Don't give up. Because I'm telling you right now, he gives us this tremendous, tremendous. Listen, you talk about Thanksgiving. I know we're, we're in the Thanksgiving. We're, it's Thursday's Thanksgiving. I don't even know. Do you celebrate Thanksgiving anymore? We do. Uh, listen, my wife, my wife doesn't like her food to touch her plate, and she don't like her holidays to touch each other either. So we're probably not going to have a Christmas tree around our Thanksgiving table. But you talk about Thanksgiving. If you want to know something you're thankful for, if you are born again, blood-bought believer in Jesus, God gives us this wonderful gift. He literally pulls back the curtain, and he shows us our future. We don't deserve it. And what a gift it is. And it is a glorious future if you're a believer. It is a wonderful future if you're a believer. It doesn't matter what goes on down here. Yes, this life is tough. This life is hard. In this world, you're going to have tribulation and death and dying and crying, but he pulls back the curtain. He said, listen, just so you don't lose heart, just so you don't lose hope, I want to show
show you where you're going to be in your future. I want to show you what your future as a believer looks like. And he tells us in verse 17, he said, For the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of waters of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eye. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, I know this world is tough. I don't care what you are, what you go through. I've already looked at heaven. God has pulled back that curtain. My future is safe. My future is secure. I'm going to be before the Lamb of God. I pray you're going to be there with us. We've got everything to live for and everything to die for. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise and glory. Amen? <laughs> glory to God. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this tremendous way that you pull back a curtain and show us, if we're believers, where we're going to be. Ten years from now, one year from now, a thousand years from now, ten thousand years from now, it does not matter. You're eternal. Heaven is eternity. But just as sure as we're born, it's as sure as we're sitting in this worship center right now as believers in Christ, if we are, then we're there with the myriads and myriads of people at the throne. The throne that ought to be scary. A throne that ought to be a throne of judgment. A throne where we ought to be shaken in our boots. But because of your grace and your mercy and your sacrifice, you have turned that throne of judgment into a throne of worship. A throne of praise. A throne of victory. Help us to see it. You're going to be there. Do you see yourself there? Or are you still, after all this time attending this church, sitting out there and saying, boy, I hope so. After all this time being under this ministry with all of this good music and good preaching that God allows us to have Sunday after Sunday, are you still one of those saying, man, I hope so. God does not want you to live that way. He wants you to see yourself and your future as being bright and sure and victorious and that no grave is going to hold you down. Death, you don't have to run from it. You don't have to fear it all because of the Lamb of God. You're here today and you say, Preacher, I don't know it. I'm working on it. Or I think so or I hope so. Can I tell you, God has a better way for you than that. So if you're here today and say, Preacher, pray for me, I want to know that. I want to be able to see myself there. I want to know with all assurance that that's my future too. With loved ones that have gone on before, friends and family and reunion and fellowship and joy and no more sorrow. And no more crying. And no more cancer and death. I want to be there. And I want you to pray for me, Pastor Jeff. Anybody in the building today, would you raise your hand up? Just hold it up. Keep it up. Let me pray with you. Let me pray for you. Anybody in the building today? Now, folks, look at me just for a moment. I love y'all with all my heart, but we've just got way too many people in this building that know that they're going to heaven. And I'm glad that you do. I'm one of them. But we're going to have to let go. 144,000 Jews witnessing and being evangelists, that, that happens later. We need to be evangelistic. We need to be part of a group because God says, beautiful, beautiful are the feet of them that share the gospel of peace. How many of you know our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors, they need Jesus. This world needs Jesus. How many of you know that? Amen? 
and you got to let go. Let go of your fear. Share your story. Share people that Jesus done for you, he will do for them. Don't be afraid. And I know you say, well, pastor, I'm afraid I'm going to turn them off. Where are you going to turn them off at? Hell number one or hell number two? They're already turned off. But just maybe, just maybe your story will make an eternal difference in somebody's life. We don't have long. We do not have long. So let's try to get everybody we can into the kingdom before it's eternally too late. Let's worship while we think about that. Pastor Daddy, please.